Today I'll be taking us through the chapter on on the S3 object oriented programming system in um, in R. Um, as as the as the chapter points out, and as we discussed last week, um, S3 is is R's very first and at the same time most basic uh, uh, OOP system. Um, it's so named S3 because it came with the third version of the, the S language. Before that, there was no there were there were no o, there was no OOP system, um, and, and so this this S3 S3 was kind of the first first efforts uh, to make an OOP system available with an with an R. Um, so I guess I'll start then with the basics. Um, so what what is what is the SS3 kind of uh, in its most kind of core terms like how, what kind of characterizes the SS3 OOP system? Uh, turns out it's really basic, at, at least as I understand it. Um, so there are two things that can be said about the, the uh, S3 system. Number one, it has class. Um, and I don't, as I said last week, I don't mean that in any kind of um, congratulatory sense that it's really classy and nice. Instead, it just means that objects in this system have uh, have have a class attribute that is one thing that characterizes uh, their, their belonging to, to SS3. Um, so that's what I mean by they have a class. Uh, so for, for example, if I, if I look at, um, I'll be coming to this later, but uh, in, in, in Haven, um, uh, the Haven package, uh, which helps with ingesting data from other statistical software packages like Stata and SAS and SPSS, um, uh, there, there's a there's a class in that called the the labeled class. So uh, that's it. Basically, it's a, a, a column that has uh, value labels that provide kind of um, qualitative descriptions of of different levels, numerical levels. So that that's an example of of an object that has class. Uh, um, second thing that kind of characterizes the S3 class is that. It, and this may be true for other other OOP systems and and R. I've not read far ahead yet, nor have I used the, the other systems, at least knowingly. Um, uh, it, the second thing that characterizes the uh, S3 is that, is that it uses uh, what, what in the book they call a generic function. And we'll describe, I'll go into a bit more detail on what this means and how this works. But it uses a generic function to, to describe which methods are, are available for different classes of, of inputs into a, a function. Um, and then uh, the OOP, uh, the, S, the S3 object uses a, a method called dispatch, which is the, the profit process of finding the right method as a function of the class of the input. So an example of this might be, let's imagine you have some, uh, some S3 um, function that, um, that accepts uh, numeric values and string values. So then um, it, it'll probably have a print method for, let's see, like a print method for numeric values, a print method for string values. Um, and this, this generic function um, and some of the other machinery surrounding it helps R determine as a function of the class of the object that's, that's uh, being, um, being manipulated or that's being passed to the function, which method should should be used so it'll kind of look through the the, the set set of um look at the class of the input and then decide on a dispatch um method so one of the many methods that are available that should be utilized in treating this incoming object so basically in short uh it seems like the s3 s3 oop system is characterized by having a class attribute and then having the system of generic functions um that that uh, that kind of define which methods are are um, available um, uh, for handling an input. Strange, it seems like section to section, my zoom level changes. Um, so now let's talk. Uh, let's talk. So we talked about class and we talked about generic methods. We'll talk about each one of these things in 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 in, in detail as well as a few other uh, as well as the topic of inheritance. So let's go step by step. Um, first with class. <clears throat> so kind of what is 
what is class um, kind of un unhelpfully in S3? Um, I think this is unlike other OOP systems. Oh, sorry, I've got some formatting problems. These should be bullets that are below that. Sorry about that. Um, uh, there's actually no formal definition of, of, of a class in S3. It's, it's really actually just a character string that's passed to the object as an attribute, a class attribute. Um, so you simply set that attribute. That, that is kind of the practical definition of class. There's no, there are no kind of formal requirements on what constitutes a class or doesn't constitute a class. In S3, it's a, simply a character string that's passed to the, the class uh, uh, as a class attribute of an object. How then do you set the class? Um, so kind of uh, just as we described, but there are kind of two moments in which the, the book kind of draws our attention to two ways in which this can be done, which in turn actually are kind of correspond to two moments of which this can be done. So first is at the time of creating an object, you can use this structure function. So let's imagine we're just, we have a list that we're gonna give some class called my class. Um, so you'd use a structure function that takes an object um, and, then, and then gives it a class. Um, so that's a way that you could do it at, this, at the time at which you create an instance of this class. So X will be an instance of the class, my class. So this is how you could kind of define the thing and give it a class at the same time. Um, so you're constructing an instance of, uh, of the class. We'll come to construction and constructors uh, shortly. Um, or you can do it afterwards, right? So imagine you already have some list that you've generated in your R code and you want to make it a member, you want to make it a member of, of the of the my class class. So all you'd have to do is you could just you know set the class um, attribute of, of X and 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 uh, uh, give it this class um, my class, right? Sorry again for the formatting. I, I think I've got some I'm missing some spaces here. Um but um, so this is kind of the theory about how how you would do it. Um, there, the book also gives kind of some some advice on style, which maybe isn't shouldn't be under the heading of theory, but it's some advice on style. Um, so there's really only one rule: um, is that it needs to be a character string, right? The class the class needs to be a character string. So this piece right here needs to be a character string. Um, but the book gives a few bits of advice. Um, so the first is that it, it's good practice. So I'll just highlight this since it doesn't pop out as a bullet. Um, is is to inc consider including the name. So if if a if a class is defined in a package, um, as is often the case, um, consider including the name of the package in in the um, in the class. Right. This is kind of for maybe a few reasons, you know, number one, um, someone could easily discern the, the parentage, if I can put it that way, it's like to which package a certain class belongs, what, what generated it, but also, and probably most importantly, it, it helps avoid name collision where the names are names of classes, right? So we could have, you know, class, class, um, you know, class Ryan, right? Um, easily we could have that, but there might be some other Ryan out there who's also generating something with object class Ryan. But because of the way that packages, um, because of some of the strictures around package names, at least those that are submitted to CRAN need to have an unclaimed name, right? Um, and so this combination of package name and class name um, would, would in principle give us better hopes of having a unique class name. Um, so, you know, and a couple examples of that. So one that's, that's a, a case where we've only got just a, a single class is this, uh, this package called blob, which deals with storing, um, blobs, um, kind of like image files, um, for example, um, and it just has a single class blob, right? Which is also the name of the package. Um, but then you have another example. Uh, so this is the case where the class is 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 exactly identical to the name or sorry, the name of the class is ident is identical to the name of the package another case could be like, like the case for haven right here as i'd mentioned this earlier on is you know haven is a package um and and haven actually has kind of two classes one is is labeled which i think is kind of a little bit of a legacy class and then you have this haven underscore labeled now this is kind of the convention of the book 
uh, and I'll come to this in a moment, it really kind of recommends is that you have the name of the package, in this case, Haven, underscore, um, and then the name of the class, right? So it's kind of catted together a little, pasted together a little bit. Um, in that case, you know, if Haven had several classes, um, then, you know, you would know that both belong to Haven, but then kind of the combination of the two would yield a unique name of class, right? Um, and then, so this is kind of advice and then just some of the conventions in the past chapter, um, the author Hadley kind of often repeated that, that S3 is, is, is kind of a, a more of a set of conventions than a set of rules. One convention that he recommends here is is to um, you know when when coming up with names to use the underscore and avoid the the dot as a separator. So you don't you would want to find Haven underscore labeled instead of Haven dot labeled. The reason being that um, uh, oftentimes you'll want to name the generic functions uh, using the convention where it be Haven dot labeled or so basically be um, uh, Haven. Uh, dot and then method, right? So this is kind of the object-oriented kind of syntax, if I could put it that way. So you want to avoid confusion between those those two. So it's, you know, just reserve for class names, um, uh, uh, underscore separators, and the dot for names of of uh, um, of methods uh, that are that are available. So that's a little bit the theory. Um, now, kind of on to the practice. Uh, the practical bits. Um, so this is kind of on how to ascribe class. Um, all those falls in, under the class rubric within the chapter. It treats a little bit of a separate, separate but not unrelated topic. Is you know, okay, how then do we create? How then do we 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 create fun What functions do we create with our S3 class? So Hadley points to to you know basically um, class composition should should take on one to three components, right? Um, at a minimum, you need to have a constructor. Um, and depending on your use case, you may also have a validator and helper. What are these things then? So um, I'll give a brief description of each in turn, and then we'll look at them in a little bit more detail. So for the constructor, this is meant to be a developer-oriented uh, function um, that creates a new instance of the target class. Um, so in other words, it's a way in which your code can create a new instance of, of the class that you're, you're creating. So let's imagine you, you're creating a, a, a date time class, let's imagine, right? So then you would want to have a constructor function um, that your code can use to create a date time class and provide it all of the, all the inputs that are required to construct that, that class, right? So clearly you always want that. Um, so that you, you as a developer have a means of creating an instance of, of the class. Um, now, depending on whether, you know, your, your class is going to have kind of a user, you want your class to have kind of user facing um, uh, const kind of constructor functions, you, you may also want to have a helper function, which um, is similar is maybe similar perhaps in the results to a constructor in that it helps you create a new instance of a target class, but differs insofar as the helper is meant to be a function that's used by the user, um, and and it will have some some attributes. And this kind of drives us back now to the validators. You may want to have some function that checks that the inputs provided to the constructor function, you know, before they come to the constructor function. That the, that the inputs provided are valid, right? And you may have some rules about what, what kind of, um, what characterizes a valid, valid inputs. Um, you know, for example, if, if you wanna have a, uh, uh, like a date time, a date time, um, if you're creating a date time class, then, you know, surely you want to have month, or sorry, a year, month, day, and maybe also times, right? Um, so you would want, to have a validator function that would discern whether each each uh, element of the inputs is is valid, right? Um, for example, the year shouldn't have negative numbers, et, et cetera, right? Maybe something like that, or you are not going to have a month number thirteen, um, um, right? Uh, some of these may be cheap, some of these may be expensive to validate. 
but you want to put this in a separate function. And basically what the helper function is, it's sort of a wrapper function that uh, in, in practice that wraps these two things. So first it validates the inputs. And then if, if those inputs pass validation, then it goes on to construct an instance of the class. That's kind of the way in which this, this, this works uh, in practice. To see this with a little bit more of a concrete details, let's, let's kind of look at each in turn. So um, actually I should have chosen a better example earlier, but uh, you know, let's imagine we have some function like this. It's gonna create a new um, uh, a diff time, right? So difference between two, two points in time. Um, so here you would want to have um, a, fun a function like this that, that is composed of a few pieces. So maybe you want to have at, at the, um, just kind of look at the, let's look at the internals here. So you want to check that the inputs are, are valid so that X is a double, you need it to be a double. And that the units selected um, uh, are in this set, in this strict set of potential units, right? And if it's if it's not, then what's going to happen is is that R will issue some some generic system kind of error messages um, that helpfully error, but unhelpfully may not be that readable by a, by by a user or that useful to 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 an end user, right? This is very much kind of for for a developer. Um, and then the second bit um, is, is simply to construct construct an instance of that class. So you have you know structure take x, assign it the, the, the time, the, the class diff units, and then it has an attribute of, of the units right here. So you're constructing uh, an instance of your class. This is a constructor or a developer. Now let's look at, at uh, now let's look at the validator. Um, so let's kind of, you know, compare and contrast, you know, the validations, um, the validations that, that, uh, that, that both things are doing. So let's look back at that, at the, uh, um, the constructor function that we just saw. So remember, you know, stop if not integer, stop if not character. Um, so now we're, we're, we're switching gears with a new example to look at creating a new instance of a factor. Um, and if you look here, we're, we're creating a new factor and we're passing it some invalid arguments. And if that's the case, you'll see that what gets triggered is, um, um, yeah, that you have a, like, basically you'll, you'll get this error message. Uh, as, as character factor, is, is it's malformed factor, right? Um, with a little head scratching, you and I can probably figure out what this means, but for an end user, it's not a very helpful error message. Whereas what a validator would want to do, um, you know, it's kind of different both in, in terms of the, I, I guess the difference here is in the scope, uh, in the scope of the validations and then the outputs of the validations. So the scope of the validations here for the constructor function is really just to make sure that you have inputs of the types that you expect, right? So that this so that things won't, well, you won't, you won't create an instance of a class that makes no sense, right? Um, whereas the scope of the validator is really to make sure that these, that these inputs, these inputs make, make some sense. Um, and, and so you have a couple, couple checks uh, here, um, you know, that'll look and see um, all values must be, must be non-missing and greater than zero. Uh, there must be uh, at least as many levels um, in uh, right, and then and if you if you execute this, then you'll see that the error message is much more user friendly here, right? So you'll see error. There must be at least as many levels as possible in values of x. This is a lot more useful for 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 an end user. So that's on the constructor. Now now the helper, uh, as we as we kind of described before, the helper really just kind of blends together these two things. Like in practice, what you'll see is a helper, a helper function um, uh, uh, that, that, you know, has kind of, uh, that calls these two functions, these two functions that we've just seen are types of functions that'll first call the validator to validate the inputs, and then it'll call the constructor function. Um, and it's got a few kind of desired virtues. You know, you, you might want it to have the same name as the class that you're creating or something very close to it. Um, uh, as I said, you know, call, call, you want it to call the constructor and the validator if the validator exists, um, provide, uh, you know, useful user facing error messages. And then uh, importantly, and the book goes on into a great detail on this, on this point, um, I, I don't in the notes, um, but it is a, a very nice discussion if you're interested about this is, um, have the helper additionally do some, um, Adopt some thoughtful or useful default values um, 
and or do some helpful type conversion. So for example, coming back to our date, our date time um, uh, example, you know, maybe, maybe is uh, for the date time, um, you, uh, uh, your, your helper function might let the time, might provide some defaults for, for, for the time of day, right? And just assume that everything is, is midnight or 11.59 PM, right? Um, uh, but require that there be that there be a date. So that might be a useful default for kind of a lazy user generating a date a date time. Um, and you might want to do some type conversion too. So for example, if if you ultimately you need to have a double um, uh, as an input for your constructor function, um, perhaps you can ease the burden on your users by accepting integers and simply silently recasting them to double so that the constructor function gets the type uh, of input that it's that it's expecting right so helper functions can can help and help in that way um right so this is kind of on creating the class itself or creating instances of the class the other piece um that i said that at least from my reading kind of really characterizes the s3 s3 uh S3 um, OOP system, S3 class, and perhaps this is true for others, is that, that it uses it uses this framework of, of creating a generic function um, uh, and then creating a set of methods that that uh, um, for, for handling inputs of different types. Um, and then beyond this, there's a, a kind of a system of dispatch that um, helps your function uh, determine which method to utilize as a function of the class or the type that the input value is. Um, so you know when you see when you see this kind of framework, I think this is a little, I think the book says perhaps it's in the last chapter, this is a tell, telltale sign that you're dealing with an S3 if, if you see this use method call. Um, and often what you'll you'll find is that you'll have this you know some generic function of a function with uh, with some or with one or more arguments here we just have x and then you'll have inside of this function this is the generic function a call to use method and then it points uh, and then it takes the very same name as the function itself so there's a little repetition here um what's what's interesting uh it, it you'll notice is that in use method um when it's saying use you know, use a method of, uh, of this class. It's not passing on X, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, in the book, the author says that through some, I think he says, you know, uh, deep dark magic, uh, you know, that, that it kind of auto, that, that the use method function automatically without our having to, you know, pass X onwards takes X and then passes it on to the, to, to kind of the, the method that'll, that'll, um, take care of the rest of the work, right? So that's kind of an interesting, interesting feature. So you need to first create a generic uh, function of of this of this uh, of this sort, um, and then and then afterwards, there you need to have you need to have some 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 um, some methods, um, and and then dispatch will kind of determine what what to, what to do with it thereafter. So let's 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 look at an example here, you know, of, of method dispatch kind of in practice, and this will come up in subsequent sections. You know, with use method, what you end up creating is you end up creating a vector of method names, um, and then dispatch kind of examines each element of that that vector of method names, and then selects a method. Um, if you want to know which would have been, you know, which was selected in practice, uh, sloop to the rescue. So Sloop has a function where uh, called S3 dispatch, which will actually somehow deter, you know, show for you which uh, which which method was was used. Um, so for example, let's create a date system. You know, we'll just take our, our system system date, um, pass it to X, and now what we want to do is simply print X, right? So it turns out <clears throat> for for this for this class. Um, this is the POSIX, POSIX CT or TCI. Anyway, one of the POSIX, um, for, anyway, whatever class the date time is, I, I should have put this in the notes. Uh, there are two print, print methods that are available or that are 
that are defined um, uh, for kind of members of this class. One is the date. Uh, so actually, this must be a date. Then. Um, uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a, a a date method, and then there's a default method. That's kind of a fallback option uh, in case uh, in case for whatever reason, you know, X happens not to be a member of the date date method. And what you can see in the output here is in a sense like the, set, the the list of the methods that are available so this is uh you know you've got the print the print methods that that are that are available um for the cl different classes um and then you can see which was used so when you see this marker the equal signs and uh, kind of in, in effect an arrow this this is a method that was used when when printing when printing this so the printing doesn't happen but instead this little sloop method kind of um uh Kind of captures. I wouldn't be a side effect exactly, but can examine the internals of what's going on and and, and then show to you which method was 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 chosen. Right. So there's there's a method around that. Um, now, how then are methods are methods found? Um, so you know, S3 dispatch gives us the the end result uh, of a specific call. But what it doesn't give us is it doesn't give us kind of the list of all the methods that are that are available. If you want that, um, again, sloop to the rescue. Uh, so it has a function called S3 methods generic. Um, so it'll give you all of the all of the methods that are defined for you know the generic function. So let's just take you know mean for example. Then you can see you can see uh, you can see all of the 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 so this is the generic function mean, all of the classes that are that are available, and then yeah, so you have this kind of list of list of methods. Um, or, or if you want, uh, for a specific class, then again, Sloop has a function where you can see the S3 methods for a, sp a specific class. Um, so if you want to see the ordered class, you know, ordered factor, um, then you can see all of the methods that are available, uh, for, for a particular class. Right. Um, so we've talked about, talked about generic functions, talked about method dispatch, um, and um, now let's talk a little bit about kind of creating methods. Um, the, the chapter was a bit terse on this, or, or perhaps I've, or, or alternatively, maybe I've, I've, I've unhelpfully omitted some of the useful details in the chapter, but it basically said that there are just kind of two rules. Um, you know, that, um, and this answers, I guess, uh, one of my queries from, from last week, actually. Uh, it advises strongly, says only, only write a method for a generic function that you own. Um, so for example, I think last week I was complaining about how um, uh, some some column, well, some columns that were of Haven labeled class um, errored when I tried to do some dplyr manipulations. I think it may be some or something like that for which the this labeled class is not does not have a defined method, right? And I was thinking out loud, I guess, towards the end of our last session, thinking, well, could I just write an extension method um, in my own package um, that handles this case? Uh, apparently, that's that's bad manners. Um, and instead, what's recommended is that you know, if if you find that um, you know one needs an additional method that isn't foreseen by the package that kind of generates a certain class work with the author of that package to include that generic or sorry to include that method in in the package that's the that's the strongly preferred um approach um and the the other the other thing um that it goes that it talks about is that you know the methods need to have the same arguments as as the generic um uh, with with one exception so if we'll kind of go back up to this um, this example, um, you know, like the you know, I'm only I'm passing x on. So um, th there's one exception where you could kind of have you could have the generic um, accept you know this kind of dot dot dot. So like an indeterminate set of of arguments. Uh, there'd be kind of like a superset of all the arguments available for all methods of a class. And then have a particular method utilize only a subset, uh, uh, a subset of those those arguments, um, right? Um, maybe to provide a little bit 
of detail to, or sorry, a little bit of helpful detail to this. I, I wanted to kind of briefly show a few examples that I guess are kind of caught in the wild. Um, so uh, I think labeled, the even labeled class will be my, the equivalent of my Hadley's 2022 uh, R Studio Conf talk. I'm gonna harp on this a lot during the, the today's today's session. But you know, here here's an example of, of of kind of one of these caught in the wild. So we have this function that exists within within um, uh, Haven uh, called Zap Label, uh, and, and the brief version of what it does, well, actually, yeah, uh, removes the variable label um, of for a column. So let's imagine you have a column that's called you know ABC. Right, maybe an unhelpful variable name. Within Haven, uh, one could assign a, a variable label to it that would be like a, a string descriptor um, uh, that, that kind of basically metadata, if you will, that describes the con maybe the contents of that column in, in some more helpful words. Oftentimes, that's I mean, out you know, in the worlds that utilize SAS and SPSS and and, and Stata, this is the norm pretty strong norm that all variables be be labeled. Uh, so the data are somewhat self-documented. So if you import a data set that has this, maybe you might want to you know, get rid of those labels for, for some reason. So here you'll see some of the things we we're talking about. So here we've got we've got a generic function, right? Zap label, function x, use method, zap label. So you see these two things are the very same. Uh, and then you'll look below here and there are two, there are two methods. Um, uh, there are two methods. So there's a method, uh, so zap label method that's for a default and then for 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 a data frame. Um, so if you have just for example a a a character vector that's that's labeled, then what you're going to do is you're going to set the the label attribute to null. Right? That's actually how the, the the label comes into existence. It's it's a uh, it's um, it's passed to the label attribute of of of, uh, of an object. Um, and then you're going to return X, right? So that's the default fallback option. Now, if it turns out that what you're passing uh, zap label because it accepts um, data set uh, data frames as an, uh, as, as, a, uh, as an object, then you're going to do the very the very same and just kind of L apply that. So do that for all um, all columns in the in the data frame X, right? To to remove to remove that. Um, you know, and this is this method is going to end up being being that. So this is kind of a case where you know you've got this this S3 setup that we've just described, where you have a, a generic function, and uh, and then you have then you have several several methods, and then you know behind the scenes um, method dispatch is going to determine as a function of the type of the input which method to use. Right. Um, another another example. Um, Maybe I'll, in the interest of time, I'll just maybe use uh, one example. This isn't as clear and concise as 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 a zap label, but let's take this um, the the tidyr package, which you know uh, helps a lot with um, uh, rectangling, if I can if I can say it that way. So like taking taking an untidy data frame that maybe is not in the rectangular or in our desired rectangular format, and making it making it tidy, um, refer to Hadley's paper and definition of what constitutes tidy data. Anyway, if I scroll down a lot after all of the uh, Roxygen um, comments, um, I'll see a very similar setup to what I saw before. So I have this generic function, pivot longer, um, as a function that takes several arguments um, and then ultimately, uh, ultimately um, I have a use method and then if I scroll down, I'll, I'll find I'll find that I have a, a method for for data frames. What's kind of interesting about this one is that I wasn't at least in this in this file able to find any other methods. So I thought this was kind of curious. Um, maybe this will hopefully a, let's kind of bookmark this as maybe a question for the group towards the end of the, the talk is why would one want to do this, right? Why not? Why create? Um, why create a single method? Um, why why not just kind of have all of this appear inside of this? Unless maybe the package authors didn't have the time to execute other methods, but wanted to leave the door open to the possibility 
of having extension methods in the future. Anyway, I was a little puzzled by this example. And there's another example I'll let you look at is, you know, deploy or mutate. It seems like it follows the same, same convention essentially as pivot longer where, you know, the setup, the setup is the one that we expect with a generic function, but there's only one, at least so far as I could discern, only one um, method defined. Why? I go this route if you have only one method. Um, got it. Okay. So now, now let's move on to um, to inheritance. So this is something that's that's uh, um, that affects, I think, all OOP systems. Um, let's see how it affects it in in S3. Um, so basically, there are kind of three big ideas here um, with with S3. So number one, that class is is not necessarily a an atomic vector, like or, or, or like the, you're, you have you can have, you can have more than one element in in, in the class of vectors. And, and that inheritance basically um, indicates kind of, this is kind of the, let's say the, the, the class lineage of, of, a, of a particular class in vector format. So if I have a class of ordered, so we're talking about factors here, ordered factors, that ordered is a subclass and factor is the parent class. So here you can see in this vector kind of the ans you know, the lineage, uh, the ancestry, and you know, thus the inheritance of um, um, that would happen with with uh, with with factors. Same is true with uh, you know system time here. So this is the date. You know, we've got this uh, POSIX uh, class, and then you have this parent class. Um, so that's the first big idea: is that class is a vector of classes. Not, not necessarily, and probably, you know, it might be atypical even that class will be just a single, comprised of a single element. There'll be, may well be in most cases, multiple elements. Second big idea is that dispatch kind of moves through this vector of, of classes until it finds a, a defined method. Um, so in, in this case, for example, if we look at, you know, for if, we, if we're looking to print an ordered uh, um, factor, uh, we want to see what is the dispatch method that's that's actually used. So coming back to Sloop, if we use Sloop, it'll help us discern which method we'll use. And what's interesting here is that it's using the print method for factors. It's not it's not it's not using this, right? Um, so basically, it moves through these methods until an appropriate method is 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 found. Now we'll come back to why this might be the case shortly. Um, but that's 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 interesting, right? Um, it could be the no methods available, or it could be that you know, the, the author is the, the packet, the, the class author has decided to, you know, handle, handle a certain method with, uh, with um, like a method for um, a parent class rather than the, the class itself, uh, than, than the subclass. Um, now this is actually, uh, this is a nice transition here actually. Uh, so the other thing is that what, what's interesting is that, you know, in terms of inheritance is that for a method that's being defined, the method itself can kick the ball down the road to someone else. So basically it can delegate to another method um, via this next method function. Um, so uh, for, for, for example here, this is a case where if you wanted to, uh, you wanted the subset your ordered factor, um, which dispatch method is being used. So here, it, the way to understand this output is that the method that's selected, so for the subset operator, is the factor method. But inside the factor method, the factor method says, actually, use the internal method, right? So it's actually kicking it, uh, uh, kicking it to the internal to the internal method. And the mechanism by which this is done again is within a given method to to basically use this next method function to 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 have dispatch kind of skip down to the next method. Um, to see this in practice, we'll, we'll we'll look at this this example that I'm reproducing entirely from the book. It's kind of it's a really nice nice example. Um, let's imagine that you have a class that's called secret. Uh, and the way that the secret class works is that it sort of um, uh, um, redacts your inputs. Uh, fortunately, this feels a little too timely and topical for someone living in the US. 
um, <clears throat> uh, you know, you've got this new secret uh, function. So this is, you know, our, our um, uh, this is this is our generic function, new secret, right? It takes a double. It's not a double errors. Then it creates an instance of the class secret. Now we need. Uh, now we want to have a print method for secret. So this is our print method for secret. Um, and in the print method for secret, what it does is it uh, replaces each character um, uh, of of the thing it's passed with an X. Um, right. Uh, so that if you have, you know, new secret, you know, where you have this vector fifteen one four five six then the outputs will be XX because 15 has two characters, X because one has one character, and XXX because four, five, six has three characters, right? Um, so let's imagine we have this, this, uh, this um, class, right? Um, with this print method. Now, what if we wanted to, what if we wanted to subset, um, you know, we wanted to kind of cr create an instance of our class and then subset, uh, you know, subset some, uh, some set, subset some vector uh, of that class. Now, you'll notice here, you know, we only have a print method. Um, that there's no, that there's no, um, you know, there's no, there's no method yet defined for like a subset operation for secret, right? And what ends up happening um, is that if you try to subset, uh, it'll, um, uh, you'll get back the original value, which kind of in, in this constructed example is exactly what you wouldn't want with this secret method, right? It's not a redacted value, but it's the real value itself. So you can fix this by, the book goes on at more length about this, so I'm kind of cutting to the, the answer or the, the solution, um, is that you can fix this by creating a secret, uh, 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 or you, you know, like a subset operator um, of the secret class, right? And it would look a little something like like this. Um, so you're going to first kind of, um, what you're going to do is, is, is you're going to, you know, you've got the secret class right here, and, and you're going to just say, you know, new C, what I'm going to do, is, is, is what you're going to do rather is you're going to, um, for executing um, the subset operation, you're going to use the next method, and it'll end up taking the uh, internal method. So it'll return 15 and then it will restore. So, we, you know, it, um, <coughs> it'll take an, ele sorry, an element from our, our array right here. At this stage, kind of within, well within the parentheses, next method will, 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 will return the, um, so here, here I have a, I have a method for the subset operator in the secret class, right? And what I'm doing, instead of doing something in a certain sense is, um, or sort of instead of, is I'm, I'm saying, let me delegate the work of handling the subset operation to, to the internal subset operator, knowing that that's going to return a value of the vector itself. But then let me wrap that result in new secret, which has the effect of then redacting it. Um, so in that way, you know, I, even when I do the sub the subsets uh, subsetting a secret will will give will still give me what I what I what I want but I'm I'm delegating part of the work of subsetting to you know to the internal subsetting subset operator and and if we look at this you know if we look at the dispatch um, with sloop that's exactly what we see so you know uh, if I if I I want to take the first element uh, of um, of x so um, where X uh, we defined previously as, you know, it'll be this, right? So I should get back X, X, uh, since that's the first element of this, this array X. Um, what Dispatcher does is it first, you know, the first thing it hits on is, is this subset operator for this secret class, right? And what that does is, uh, is then it dispatches part of the work to the internal subset operator. And then, you know, then it returns back here and, and kind of wraps the result and uh, you're recreating the secret class. So that basically we're solving the problem of, you know, we could kind of inadvertently um, by using some method not to, uh, that we've not defined for, for our, our class that we could 
get back something that is not of the class that we're creating. We would want to have like class permanence, if I could put it that way, that, you know, uh, unless there's some operation whose purpose is to coerce this into some other class or some other type, we'd want the, we'd want, you know, whatever is created by our functions to have class preserved, right? And this is a way in which this can be done for the, for the subset operation. Actually, for this point, it turns out that um, the vectors package has a nice, uh, nice, nice way of, of, of doing this. Um, so that's, that's for, that's, you know, a little bit on, on, an, on inheritance and, and the next method part. Another uh, section that, another topic that the book focuses on is, you know, how would, how would you go about allowing subclasses with, 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 a, with an S3 class? So let's imagine, you know, what we want is, you know, a secret class is not enough for us. We want to have the super secret class, which not only redacts um, uh, the input value, but doesn't give any indication in the output value of actually even the length of the input, right? So if we give, if we feed it one, two, three, it's going to give us five Xs. If we give it uh, you know, an eight character number, it's still going to give us five Xs. If we give it the value one, it's still going to give us a five Xs. So it's redacted without any information, kind of even the length of the, of the, 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 the numeric input. So the way we could do this is, is we could set up our constructor function um, such that, um, you know, number one, it, it, it uh, allows you to kind of uh, pass the dots, right? So you can have arbitrary set of arguments that m some of which are relevant for subclasses, maybe some only some of which are relevant for the class itself. And then you can pass the, the, the class as an argument. Um, and you'll notice here when we're creating the class, like one thing that's interesting here is with the class, we're, we're creating an array, a character array, where we're sort of prepending the name of the, the subclass. So in that way, and, and that makes sense. And that's what we what we would want, where we'd want to have, you know, a character array where on the left-hand side, you find kind of the, the child class. And the farther right you move, you're moving up the, 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 the family tree of the class, you know, in terms of its parentage, right? In a certain sense, this is a, uh, you know, we talked about function factory. So this is kind of like a class factory, if I could put it this way. Um, so if we now wanted to create the super secret class, what you could do is you could, you know, create your generic function super secret, um, or sorry, your, your um, constructor function rather for super secret. Um, and basically uh, what it does is it calls um, this, this, this constructor, this new secret constructor, and then passes the class super secret. Uh, and then we can define for super secret a print a print method. Um, <clears throat> one problem the book poses at this point, and I feel like the text didn't adequately resolve this. If I'd had more time, I would have wanted to go in more detail on this, is that now that you have a, a subclass, um, one potential problem that could arise is that for the sub subclass, um, by default, you, you're going to inherit um, uh, you're going to inherit all of the all of the meth all of the merits all the methods for the parent class, and then you might have to go around uh, if you wanted to have different kind of behavior overriding all of the the parent methods, but with specifically targeting targeting the sub subclass, um, uh, and then importantly, kind of making sure that any manipulations of the subclass will yield an object of the subclass rather than an object of the parent class because there's this issue with inheritance if you kind of go to the parent method you may end up yielding you may end up generating an object of the parent class and not an object of the subclass right so you can see this this, this little difficulty here and Hadley knows is basically there's no is at least to his knowledge uh, which I'll take as kind of uh, exhaustive there's no easy solution for this in base R um, but that, um, uh, vector. This is one of the motivations among many of vectors. So there's this nice uh, function called vec restore, um, wherein um, there's an easy method for sort of um, subclass um, preservation um, in, in, in this scenario. And I think I'll stop there. Um, I, I guess I'm pretty much at time in any case. But uh, this is this is what what I what I wanted to share about S3 classes. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the outset. Uh, for this chapter, I found it a little, a little dry. I, 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 I don't know. Um, for me, I, I sometimes I, I find myself not often enough, but I find myself looking at 
looking at kind of source code from other people. And I, 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 previously, I didn't understand what was going on here. I had a, a vague notion of what was going on here. Now I have a, a much better notion of what's going on here. But I feel like there's maybe, in a certain sense, like a missing set of information of, OK, you're going to use, you know, when, number one, when would you want to use an S3 class? And then number three, what are sort of best practices in writing a package that utilizes S3, the S3 class? You know, how, how would you go about doing that? This chapter does not talk about that on purpose. That's that would make for a, an overwide scope. But I also uh, briefly peeked at the, um, the um, R packages book also by Hadley. And didn't see any discussion there, so I don't know if this is uh, this is something that's kind of um, non-canonical information that uh, <clears throat> the interested parties would either need to hunt down, or as is often the case for some of these maybe sort of pseudo fringe topics, is just look at other people's source code, squints, and think about it hard enough. Eventually, <coughs> pardon me. Um, <coughs> intuition will come. And with that and coughing, I guess I'll pass to you guys see if you have any questions, comments. Thanks. Arthur, what I was going to add to that last comment about kind of the fringe concepts here, um, just remember that a lot of R was generated at the same time that Unix and I, uh, C was was also taking place. So the the, the computing architecture at that moment in time when a lot of these tools were being generated all kind of reference or or I don't know interact in a similar fashion right so our book clubs are all dedicated to the R language as a focus topic it would be advisable if you want to jump out and start looking at either C or C++ in relation to how it handles a lot of this um, classification, inheritance, uh, uh, recursive functions, et cetera, because it would it would imply how R actually manages it as well. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's really that's I think that's potentially really helpful, Ryan. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think is sometimes uh, I find I find a lot of people kind of lamenting lamenting well both happy and lamenting about the following fact uh, about the R community is that um, yeah. we're not software developers, <clears throat> no, which, exactly. which, which is a good thing in the sense that we probably demand sure. of the tools that they be user friendly and ergonomic. Um, maybe you're less patient with um, badly designed APIs. Um, but on, on the other hand, you know, we may be less knowledgeable about how the rest of the world, how the rest of the computing world works. And maybe less uh, able to bring some of the best practices yes. from outside into into R, right? I, I I see the S3 chapter as being I have an error, but I don't know why the error is telling me, uh, you know, how to correct it, uh, type concept or or your mention of package development, creating other methods, etc., um, or other functions. This is important within that context. Uh, if 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 you were to take that path. Right. I, I I think that uh, this presentation has really given um, uh, like an introduction to um, to how to um, manage those things eventually. Uh, so that that are uh, parts with very important when you like make a function and uh, you want to put this function inside a package. Um, to fully comprehend all, all these things, I think, I believe it takes time and practice. So uh, I've, I've now uh, quite a clear idea of what we are talking about. N not totally, uh, not totally clear because I need to deal with the, the with these things, and then uh, everything would be much better uh, understandable. But now, for now, let's say that um, we have different objects in uh, in. Uh, within the, the R framework. 
And uh, these objects are defined and have uh, different laws to, to use. So uh, it depends by the, what you are going to, to do. You can uh, uh, like set up uh, for an object, which is an S3 object or an S4 object or a base type object. Uh, and so, um, so I think it's um, it's a it's a nice introduction, a breakthrough. Uh, how to use these methods? Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, Federica. I I kind of felt the same way. I mean, it felt like a, <clears throat> I guess, some sort of uh, <clears throat> typical economist fashion and mathematician fashion is like it, it seemed like a necessary but not su sufficient kind of like exposition of a. Uh, or like exposition to kind of understand S3. Like I, I kind of have a broad sense of what it works. Uh, I mean, and maybe kind of a question that we can, we should carry over perhaps to Slack is I'd be very interested to hear if others have actually developed packages that use S3 methods. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and, and kind of if so, um, you know, could kind of, talk a little bit about um, uh, kind of like how they went about that. Because I, for, for me, if you will, like I, I feel like this is a nice introduction, but I'm a little bit, I'm not sure where to go next, right? To go looking to deepen my knowledge about S3 class. I mean, there's the obvious answer of scouring through source code, uh, but I don't know if there's any more consolidated uh, body of, body of knowledge that might help me navigate that as someone who is kind of a hobbyist uh, uh, package developer. Anyway, that's maybe a, a, a large question for, for, for Slack's discussion. Thank you very much. So I think we, 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 are, we reached the top of the hour. Um, let, let's meditate. Uh, think about it a bit and then maybe next time we uh, encounter uh, one S3 object, we, we will take a look with more care and see what is it <laughs> and how it's composed in that specific case. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for attending the session and see you all next week. Yeah? See you next week. Great job, Arthur. Thank you. Right, thanks. Thank you very much. All right, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.